Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, praise the Lord. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's, a, it's such a blessing to come to the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I want to welcome everyone here uh, today to the Lady Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to welcome those online as well, who are streaming as well. Hello. Happy Sabbath. And for those in the fellowship hall and uh, foyer, welcome. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, we have several announcements, and uh, if for those who haven't had any bulletins, the bulletins are in the back, but if you raise your hands, we can get a bulletin to you. We have several announcements um, in regards to uh, what's going on in the church, and you guys can take note of that. But I want to point out some uh, key ones that uh, we have. Uh, today, a uh, special uh, memorial service for Jenny Brubaker will be held here at 2 p.m. So at 2 p.m. here um, uh, for Jenny, uh, for those who uh, would like to... Uh, uh, commemorate uh, uh, Jenny at 2 p.m. here at the church. Um, there's another insert. If you guys, uh, it's a key thing that I have interest in. At the last week end of September, the Florida Conference is having a health conference at uh, uh, Camp Kalakwa. It's called Health and Fitness Retreat. It's this insert here that you have in your bulletin. It's from uh, September 30th to October 2nd. There are going to be some key uh, speakers uh, in dealings with health and wellness and, um, and fitness. So I highly recommend uh, for those who are able to go. Uh, the key speaker is going to be uh, Roy Ice, who's the author and editor of Lifestyle Magazine. So some, some key uh, speakers there, and it will be an enjoyable time to learn about health and wellness. So don't uh, mark that in your calendars. There will be more info on uh, the schedule uh, as the weeks uh, progress. We have another announcement from uh, Chris and uh, Cindy. So I'll have them come up. Good morning, church family. Do you know why we're up here? That's right. We're up here talking about our literature board in the lobby. I'm sure you all see it when you come in and when you go out. And I, I told Cynthia, you know, I pray over that board, and I wish that you would too, that we could pass literature to people who need it and help share Jesus. Have you ever watched um, Hope Channel? Anybody ever watched Hope Channel? Revival for Mission? Well, Cynthia told me about this one that was about literature. And so I said, why don't you tell the story? And she says, why don't you tell the story? <laughs> So I'm going to try to tell the story, and if I forget something, you jump right in. Okay, it was a pastor from Texas, and on Friday afternoon, he was pumping gas in his car, and a young, um, about an 18-year-old boy drove up in a brand new sports car, and he could tell it was his baby. He got out very carefully and closed the door very carefully, opened the gas tank very carefully, and started pumping gas. Then another young man about his age squealed into the parking lot with a pickup truck. And he got out of the pickup truck with his hand behind his back and started walking over to him, um, screaming profanities. And they get, got into a verbal confrontation. And it kept escalating. And he could see the young man with the sports car getting ready to use that gas pump towards the other boy. And they were face to face and he prayed, Lord, what would you have me do? And it came to his head, give him some literature. And he said, Lord, really, what would you have me do? And he heard it again. It's his, the voice said, give him some literature. Well, he had some tracks in his glove compartment, so he quick ran around, pulled out the tracks, went over and got between the two boys and said, hi, I have something here for you. So he handed him each a piece of literature and they quit yelling, and, started, and the, the boy in the pickup truck started walking away. And he didn't even know what he had given him. But when he looked down, it said, what happens after death? <laughs> that was the name of the track. But anyway, um, it, it made me think about the rest of that story. Um, the pastor told about how when he was a boy, HMS Richards had a literature pocket, so he always had literature on him. 
since this episode now, this pastor always carries literature on him instead of leaving it in the car. He's got a lit literature pocket. And Elder Ted Wilson does the interviews for this mission revival. And he said, it's your eternal worth to share your faith with love. We don't badger. We don't lecture. We share it with love. And that man had a divine appointment that day to help those two young men. Wouldn't you love to have a divine appointment? There was one of our um, devotional books that John Bradshaw wrote, and he said sharing literature can be the simple, inexpensive, and extremely effective way of sharing Jesus with others. So now Cynthia is going to talk about our board. Wasn't that a great story? When, when I saw it on that show, I, I told Chris, I said, man, that is just awesome. Because you never know what God is going to do with these little tracks and just how powerful they can be. Uh, and it's all because of you that we have this literature board out here that we can share. Your past offerings to local evangelism has made it possible for us to buy the literature for that board. And because it's been such a great success and we don't want to take anything extra out of the local evangelism uh, offering, we now have our own little category called literature board that you can donate to. So on your offering envelope, you can write literature board, and the treasurer will know exactly where to put those funds. If you do your uh, tithe and offering on the AdventistGiving.org site like I do, there's a little link you can click on under the local budget that says more offering categories. That will open a window that has a whole long list of the different categories you can donate for our church. Just look for literature, click the box, and it will bring it up on the site for you so you can donate to it. We thank you so much for your support. Chris and I are just elated to have this board, and we thank you for your support for it. And we know the Holy Spirit will use it to encourage others. Let me just say one more word. There, there's some literature out there for children, for teenagers, and I have seen Dr. Sun sitting in the chair in the lobby reading some. He was probably reading the adult ones, but we do have children ones too. <laughs> but Cynthia, when her and David went to Texas, she took literature and passed it along the way, left it in motel rooms, restaurants, or whatever. And now Jean and Alan, Jean texted me and said she's running out of, she took steps to Christ, but she did take a lot of the tracks. She's been distributing them through North America, through Canada, and they're going to be flying to um, Scotland. So it's even going overseas, our little literature board. So thank you for giving. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Cindy and Chris. Um, I just kind of reminisce about when we were, uh, when I was in high school, we did literature evangelism. And we don't really know those, those powerful pamphlets, those booklets that we send out, those seeds we're planting through the Holy Spirit un until the other side of eternity. So you know, praise the Lord for uh, that ministry. Uh, before I forget, I totally forgot, I want to welcome uh, any first-time visitors here today. First-time visitors here. I had one in my class. Yes, up front. Yes. Will you stand up and uh, share us where you're from and what's your name? Oh, welcome. Lisa, welcome to, to our church. I hope you, you found your home here at our church. Praise the Lord. Anyone else? Any new visitors here? First time visitors here? Yes. Cherie. Cherie, uh, please say, oh, see, she's not bashful. Cherie, welcome. Where are you from, Cherie? Wow, you, I hope you found a home here. We welcome you. Praise the Lord, Cherie. And we have one in the back here. I know uh, we'll have you uh, stand up. We have the little girl we, we had in uh, prim, uh, primary, primary Sabbath school. I know Lily. I, I don't know her, your mom's name, Lily. Jennifer. Yes. Oh, well, welcome, welcome. Welcome, Jennifer Lily. Well, th praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, I hope you guys have found your home here, your home church here. We welcome each one of you. 
Um, you know, it's been a, uh, sometimes a difficult week for a lot of us. Uh, you know, some, some trials we've, we've gone through, um, some losses. Um, so the scripture reading for today is found, I kind of thought was fitting. It's found in John 16, verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. And it says this. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, Lord, grateful, distraught, broken, Lord. But you have called us to come, Lord. We are thankful for the opportunity to be in your presence today, Lord. I ask you, Lord, through the Holy Spirit, to enlighten our hearts, provide peace through the storms and trials of this life, Lord. Help us have direction. It's only through you, Lord, that we can obtain it. So guide us today, Lord. Bless this worship. Bless our, bless our words, our praise, our prayers to you, Lord. That it may be like sweet incense to your throne of grace. Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today, Lord. We ask you to be with all uh, the participants and uh, the pastor, Lord, as he breaks the word of life to us, Lord. Please be with us today. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Did anybody have a birthday this week? Oh, Lily? Lily had a birthday this week. I know somebody else that had a birthday this week. One of our members, Cindy, had a birthday yesterday. What day was Lily's birthday? Thursday? You know, I feel like singing happy birthday to you. Yes. Happy birthday. What? I'm sorry, we had another hand. I, I missed it. I can't. These lights are very bright up here. We'll, get, we'll make that as an excuse. What day was yours? Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. How about that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Cindy Lindell. Happy birthday to you. Oh, my. Somebody said they didn't want any more birthdays. <laughs> Oh, let's sing. What a beautiful song. Hymn number 272. Give me the Bible, isn't it? Don't you love to read the Bible? Let's all stand and sing together. Sing joyously. Give me the Bible, not a gleaming. To cheer the wonder on a tempest tossed, no storm can hide that peaceful radiance beaming. Since Jesus came to seek and save the lost, give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me through the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear, give me the precious joy of joys as spoken. Hold up faith's lamp to show my Savior dear. Give me the Bible, 
holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all my steps enlighten, teach me the danger of this realm below. That lamp of safety o'er the gloom shall brighten, that light alone, path of peace and shore. Thy light shall lighten in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. What beautiful words. Let us, let us please be seated. Good morning, church family. Um, we're about to have, take up our collection for tithes and offerings, but if I could first, I'd like to uh, thank Jacob for uh, the awesome music this morning in between church and Sabbath school. Jacob does a great job. It was beautiful this morning. Will the deacons come forward, please? You bow with me for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the love and compassion that you have for us. Through our tithes and offerings, please help us today to be a channel of your blessings to others. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. So today's loose offerings go to the lo local church budget. And I was going to say, if I may, but you don't have any choice, I'm going to anyway. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the local church budget. Um, each November, one of the business meetings that we hold, we hold them periodically throughout the year, so all the membership has a voice in how we run the church. But each November in particular, we have a business meeting and we vote on the budget for the coming year. Last November, when we met, we voted on the budget for 2022, and that budget required $3,182 per week. For us to make the budget, we need approximately $3,000 a week. Now, if you have a bulletin, if you don't, we'd be glad to get you one if you'd hold your hand up. If you have one, turn it over to the very back, and it says, Received last Sabbath for the church budget, $1,384. Uh, just real quick math tells me that that's about two grand short. Now, don't take this as an admonishment. This church... Um, is quick to reach into your billfold when we need money. We need money for new chairs. Boom, I think it took two weeks and we had money for new chairs. We need money for new doors. We needed money for church renovations. Y'all give and give and give. And we certainly appreciate that. We also appreciate the fact that God can oftentimes make a lot out of a little. Um, you know, we read the story that he read that uh, Jesus fed 5,000 people. 
uh, with two fish and five loaves. What it doesn't specifically say is that was 5,000 men. When you consider the women and children, it was probably closer to 15 or 20,000. Um, Jesus can make a lot out of a little. If you look on down, it says homeless student fund, $10,736. And I believe the goal was $10,000. Is that right, Bob? Does that sound right? $10,000? So we've already, we've already met that goal, and that, that goal we had to have that by July. So that's an awesome job of giving. And I might add that we raised that from 5000 to 10000 So we've been very gracious with our giving. The Kids Hope Orphanage, 15830 We're less than $200 from our goal, which was also an increase of 5000 Is that correct? Oh, did it stay the same? Okay, it was 11000 before. Okay. So here it is, the end of July, and we're within $200 of a December goal. Praise the Lord. So my concern is that there may be someone out there, maybe someone watching from home, maybe someone in the pews that was like I used to be, and I used to think, well, if this was before I met my uh, Adventist treasurer over here, I used to think that but my tithe was my tithe. That was good. And it is good. But you have to remember, tithes all go to the conference. Tithes do not support the church, other than we do pay for Pastor Scott's salary. Um, but if you want to keep the lights on, you want to keep it cool in here when it's 95 degrees outside? We have to keep the power on. We have to keep the water flowing. You say, well, we got a well. There's the well, there's not a, there's not a, but it takes something to run the well pump. It takes money to run this church. Um, our weekly average in May was $2,100. Not bad. We're about $1,000 short. Our average in June was 1600 So that's about half what we needed. The average in July was 1438 That's less than half of what we needed. And last week, we were 1384 So we're steadily, for some reason, we're steadily going down since May. You say, well, it's because a lot of those snowbirds went home. And probably to some degree, that's true. I just wanted to bring it to your attention that we do have a lot of financial needs to keep the church operating. And if you aren't, it's called tithes and offerings for a reason. We tithe to the conference and we make offerings to the church for doors, for chairs, for children's, uh, for the children at school, for the orphanage. Y'all give a lot of money, and we're grateful for that, and it's, it's uh, promoting God's kingdom. But I would ask you, even if it's a small amount, to consider an offering for the local church budget each week when you give so we can inch a little closer to that $3,000. Thank you, and God bless you all. All right, we'll have all the children come up and grab your baskets for the little lamb's offering.
I hope you all told those people who gave you those greenbacks, thank you. Awesome. Good morning, y'all. I'm going to turn my back to you. Good morning, kids. Can I call you kids? Yeah. All right, good. Um, I'm going to start with my text this morning because last time I gave a children's story, I forgot it. So I'm going to start this morning with the text. And it's one that you can repeat after me, okay? It's a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Now let's say it all. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Do you know what a merry heart is? No? Anybody know what a merry heart is? Yeah, when you're happy and you know it. And you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. All right. Well, yeah, I have a story that proves that Bible text. And it's about a puppy dog. Now, I have a puppy dog. His name is Opie. And Opie we got from, we call it jail because it was for the pound. It was the homeless shelter. So we said we got him out of jail. Now, when we got Opie, he looked like a ragamuffin. You know what a ragamuffin is? Kind of dirty and all matted up and his head hung low and his tail hung low. And he was just a sorry looking sight. And that's because his heart wasn't merry. Now, how do I know that? Because there was a test at some university, and it was a research university, and they researched about kindness and happiness. Yeah, so that's kind of strange. But they wanted to know how other people's actions affected you. And a dog was a good way to not use a human being for a test. So what they did is there was a, a mangy looking old dog that was running around on campus. And usually what happened when kids saw the mangy old dog is they, ew, get out of here. And they didn't feed him and they just didn't, weren't nice to him at all. So one day, the professor said, we're going to do a test. And they went and they got the puppy dog. And they brought him into the lab. And they took some of his bone marrow. And it didn't hurt him because they put him to sleep and everything. It didn't hurt him. But they took that bone marrow. And you know, it was all gray and ugly looking. They said, oh, this dog's not healthy. But then the professor says, we're going to try something. And so they let all the students know that when they saw that mangy old dog, they were supposed to be nice to it. Maybe reach down and pet him. Or maybe they were just going to talk nice to him. They gave him treats when they walked along. And they did this for about three months. And they just got that dog got to wagging his tail when he saw them. And he just changed his looks, just kind of like our Opie did. And so they said, okay, it's time to check this out. So they brought the puppy in again, and they did the same thing, and they took some marrow from his bones. And you know what it looked like this time? No, it's nice and healthy looking. It might have been yellow, but my book said it was pink. I don't know. Was it yellow or pink bone marrow? Yellow? All right. So anyway, it was healthy looking. It wasn't all gray and yucky looking. It was healthy. And we know the only thing that was different was what? Kindness, good words, happy thoughts. They treated the, the puppy with kindness, and it made a difference. Do you think that happens with people? It sure does, and now that it's time for school to start, are you ready? You ready for school? Yeah. Awesome. I know my daughter starts school Monday morning with kids, so we've been praying for her, but we're going to pray for you, kids, as you start school, that you can be kind and loving to one another, and you'll know that that makes a difference. 
Do I have a volunteer to pray? No? All right, I'll pray. Let's bow our heads, fold our hands, close our eyes. Loving Lord, thank you for being kind and loving to us. And because of your loving kindness, we can share that love with others. Help us to do that this year as we start a new school year and help us to remember that we even need to be kind and loving to our mom and dad. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading comes from Daniel 2, 44. I'm going to be reading from New King James Version. And it says, And in the days of these kings, God, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, and it, will, and it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, Elder, I bet you and Miss Susanne have real issues with personal pride, don't you? <laughs> you have to be very proud. Praise yeah, praise the Lord for you guys. Praise the Lord for uh, the gift that God has given you to parent. Good morning, church family. Morning. Welcome back, guys. Good to see you. William and Jaleesa, good to see you today. Lamar, who are these very nice people that are with you? Of course it is. Glad you are here today. Uh, have we welcomed all of our visitors already? All right. We didn't forget anybody, Joanna? All right. Very nice. Then we can move along. It's good to be here with you. Good to worship with you. I'm excited about what we're going to be studying today. Before we study, we will pray. Look at this. Ye and Nick, COVID-free, sitting right up here in the second row with our normally backseaters. And uh, was it too cold back there? Is that what it was? No? Okay. I just want to make sure you all are feeling all right. Uh, it's good to see you all here today. Anybody know what our bookmark said we should be praying for today? Power of the Holy Spirit. That's a lot of power. The question is, are we able to handle that kind of power? You know, a young man gets a powerful sports car and gets pulled over right quick. What's going to happen to us when we actually receive the power of the Holy Spirit? Lily Gibson typed in, please pray for me. I'm having a lot of pain due to her brain injury. And for good news, I get to see the neurologist on Tuesday. So please continue to pray for Lily. James Brown said this week, two 40-inch trees. I'm guessing that is circumference fell inches from his house. The Lord protected me from any damage. The tree company has already cleaned them up. Praise the Lord. And Carl typed in, asking us to please pray for Fran because she's in the hospital. Pray for Harold Knox, who is Bev's father. He's in the hospital because he had a heart attack. Pray for Beth and Paul. They both have covid Pray for Dana, who has cancer, who's only expected to live for about a year. Pray for Dawn, a friend in Tennessee, who also has cancer. He says, I will be visiting Harold this morning, and Fran and I will be live streaming with you. So I don't know if you can get an audience shot, but let's just wave at Carl and Fran. Your wave, whether you know them or not, means we love you, we miss you. And we want you to come back soon. Rob Bradley 
typed in, pray for the family of Robert Wilson. Robert was changing a flat tire and was struck and killed last weekend. So please pray for the Wilson family. And pray for the Young family and the Walker family. Phyllis Young is under the care of hospice now. That is Bob. And I didn't type this. Brooke did. Bob. She says, think, white-haired guy at the door. Bob. Um, And Linda, her daughter, Phyllis's daughter. Think, Sophie. Uh, They are with her right now at the... Brantley House up here just south of County Route 42 on 441. But please pray for them. Uh, Losing a parent stinks. Losing anybody you love stinks. Praise Jesus for the promise of the resurrection. Where would we be if we didn't have that? We'd like to remind you this afternoon to please come to Miss Jenny's memorial. That will be at 2 p.m. Some of you are thinking, oh no, I didn't bring anything to eat. Well, after the memorial, we're going to feed you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And so please continue to pray for Ray and Kelly Veyu because Marty Kraft passed away earlier this week. Uh, Miss Miss Kathy visited with them yesterday and... uh, didn't say much, was just there. But uh, what a beautiful family. And I asked her, what was that quote? What was that quote that Marty always shared? And she quoted it <laughs> verbatim. He always shared a quote from the Desire of Ages about us reflecting Jesus and, and um, his character being seen in us. Let's pray together, shall we? Uh, You're more than welcome to kneel. If getting up from that kneeling position takes you many, many moments, please remain seated and and comfortable. The Lord hears us. Yes, ma'am? Yes, and please pray for Debbie. That's Kelly's sister. Thank you for that reminder. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, Take our hearts and minds far away From the press of the world all around To your throne where grace does abound May our lives be transformed by your love May our souls be refreshed from above. At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much. For a church family that we can come and worship with. And even though our hair is all done up proverbially, we are able to let our hair down in this place. We are able to be the people that you have created us to be. Thank you for a kind, loving, and accepting church family. Lord, we have lots of new friends that are here today and we want to thank you for bringing them to this place. Lots of options, and they chose here. We want to thank you for bringing them here to us so that we could love on them and and just worship with them. Lord, the paper that I hold in my hand represents a small portion of what our church family is currently experiencing. Lord, some of us have broken hearts. Some of us have broken families. Some of us ain't a thing in the world wrong. It's all going well. And we're all here for the purpose of worshiping you. So whether we are elated or whether we are under an incredible amount of stress, We want to thank you for giving us this time to be together and to worship you. 
we love you. We thank you for loving us so much that you would give your only begotten son that if anyone would believe in him, they would not perish but have everlasting life. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our prayer, O Lord, incline thine ear to us and grant us thy peace. Amen. They ask me to pause, you know. So I have to pause before we present because it saves lots of editing. So now, so they don't have to edit that part out. <laughs> so glad that you could be here worshiping this morning. We have been on a journey. That journey has taken us all the way over to the what? What was over here? E-O-T are the initials. Uh, pick a letter, any letter. End of time, that's right. So here is the end of time. Take note of the position here. Here is the end of time, and over here is the end of the end of time. So what was this? And what is this? The end of the EOT, or the end of of the end of time. We spoke two weeks ago on prophets and false prophets, and Jesus said that we should beware of prophets when? At the end of time, that's right. There will, prophets will come and they will seek to deceive you. We also studied that the end of prophetic time took place in what year? 1844, that's absolutely right. So beyond 1844, some would argue 1798 would be the beginning of the end of time, and there's biblical evidence for both of those. So beyond 1798, beyond, and there's reasons for that, and we'll get there. We won't get there today, but we'll get there. Beyond 1844, there is no prophetic time period that happens prior to the second coming of Jesus. Now, the end of the end of time is the second coming of Jesus. So, we discussed that there was this space of time during which heaven is silent. So, open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. All the way back to the tail end of Scripture here. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And put your hand there. Don't read it. Just put your hand there. <clears throat> By the way, some, somebody was looking for a place to put two horses. I don't know who you are, but the people out front said, Hey, this person said this to me. Just talk to me afterwards. All right. Um, I'm not adopting them. But I got a place, I think. So here we are. That was a tangent. Total, total, uh, shouldn't have even been said right now, but it was said. Revelation 4 verse 8 is where we're going to read. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8. Revelation 4 sets the stage of the throne room of God. So just picture this massive throne room. Like God does not sit on some dinky little throne, all right? God is surrounded by thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of angels. It is no small room. And God is seated on this throne. And there are four living creatures. You can read Revelation 4 later and get all of the descriptions. And it may just... just blow your mind, or if you're an artist, maybe it'll blow up a page trying to paint that. 
And the Bible says in Revelation 4, 8, it says that there are these four living creatures that had, they were full of eyes, they had six wings, and read this part with me. What is it that they say day and night? Now, if something is said day and night, how often does it pause? It doesn't. So the Bible says that these four living creatures do not rest day and night, and they say, read this with me, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Again, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Day and night, David, over and over. You're in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1 now, and And it says this, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Now, this morning in Leesburg, we did quite the mathematical calisthenic to get to how long is... uh, Is William Bradley here this morning? Where's he at? I need William Bradley. Where are you at? William. This was not planned, by the way. William went home. Well, there you are. He went home like those those Bible students that you just admire. You're like, man, how did they get so biblically wise? And he sat down with a calculator, and he calculated that this Half an hour would be how long in literal time? (laughs) And just as any Bible student that wants to be diligent would do, they would review, so don't go anywhere. So, one prophetic day is how long in literal time? A year. A prophetic day is equal to a literal year. How many days are there? You're going to make me go through all this mathematical calisthenics. How many prophetic... Let's see. A prophetic day is equal to a literal year. How many days are there to a literal year in the Bible? 360. So if we take one prophetic day, which would be one prophetic time period of 24 hours, and we divide literal 360 by the 24, we would come up with what number, Pastor Bradley? 15 days for every hour. Now the Bible says that there was silence in heaven for the space of about half an hour. So what is half of 15? Why did those four living creatures stop saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come? Or did they stop at all? The reason that it's silent in heaven for the space of, half, of about half an hour is because heaven is empty. Because all of heaven is descending from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel with the trumpet call of God. That's when the dead in Christ rise first. That's when we, which are alive and remain, are caught up together with Him in the cloud. Heaven is empty. Watch this, watch this. Not even Moses or Enoch are in heaven during the space of that half an hour. Because they too are coming. On the clouds of heaven, so God can take us home. That happens at the end of the what? End of time. So, beyond 1798, we'll study that. Beyond 1844, we are living during a time where there is no biblical time prophecy that is verifiable prior to the second coming of Jesus. So what we are going to do in this journey, I realize that all of this over here, the 1798, 1844, those were 400 level college classes. I mean, we sat in here and we're just like, oh Lord, give us more inspiration. I have no clue of what some of the stuff is he's talking about. So what we're going to do is we're going to review. 
We're going back to our second year of college. That's what we're going back to. You're, in the theo- you're a theology student. Pastor Bradley, uh, you can have a seat with whomever you were sitting with before. Thank you so much for coming in and just blowing that all out for me. Appreciate you very much. We are going to look at the book of Daniel. We're going to start in chapter 2. That will be today. Some of you are like already tuning out, but here you go. Let's tune you back in. Did you know that you can find the millennium in Daniel chapter 2? Now you're re-engaged, right? Don't give me all those dates. We're not going to give you dates. Give me something new in Daniel 2. The millennium is found in Daniel chapter 2. And so right now, some of you are looking at it like, really? Where, where, where? Well, let us know if you get there before we get there together. Daniel chapter 2, then we're going to study Daniel chapter 7, then we're going to study, and I haven't decided yet whether we're going to go to 9 before we go to 8, or if we're going to go to 8 first. But 9 is actually the explanation of the beginning of 8, and so we'll see how that lands when we get there on this journey that we are together. So in Daniel chapter 2, what do you remember about Daniel chapter 2? What, what, what takes place in Daniel 2? You can sum it up in two words. Metal man. You're absolutely right. I hope somebody said that. <laughs> so metal man. In Daniel chapter, and what do those metals represent? Kingdoms. That's absolutely right. Then when we get to Daniel chapter 7, there are, what's in Daniel chapter 7? What do you remember about Daniel 7? Hi. Yeah, they're beasts, right? And what kind of beasts are they? Leesburg, somebody said ugly. Is that what you just said, ugly? So these beasts in Daniel 7 are carnivorous. They eat and they devour. You get to Daniel chapter 8, and it goes from that scene of, of chewing on raw flesh, it goes from that scene to a scene of tranquility, where you have sacrificial animals that are being described or being used as props to tell this story of what you and I would now call history. And in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, it culminates the longest time prophecy in Scripture that brings us to 1844. So we've studied all this level 400 stuff. We've got to know, how did we get over there in the first place? And so that's what we're doing. That's where our journey's taking us. We're going to end this journey when we get to Daniel 8 about what does the cleansing of the sanctuary mean. Yet for today, Daniel chapter 2 is given, a dream is given to a king, Nebuchadnezzar. And that dream is given for two reasons. Let's go to Daniel 2. Some of you are already there. Daniel chapter 2, as soon as I get there, I can tell you that verse. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31. Daniel is here speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, the greatest monarch of the then known world. He is the monarch of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. And Daniel says, Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image. This great image whose brightness was excellent stood before you. The form thereof was, King James Version, terrible. Newer translations, awesome. This was an amazing image. I wonder if the image had those, what do you call those things? Six pack. (laughs) Or if it looked more like Nebuchadnezzar. He saw this image. And this image was made of different metals. The Bible says in verse 32, his head was of gold. Who did the gold represent? Remember, this is review, 200 level college class. Babylon, that's absolutely right. His image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms were of silver. What did that represent? Medo-Persia empire. By the way, of the Medes and the Persians, who were the stronger of the two? You want to know how you can remember that very easily? When was the last time you went to a Median rug store? You don't go to Median rug stores. You go to a... Woo, you guys must be bougie. I've never been to a Persian... Persian rug store, but they have them. Then it says in verse 32 that his belly and his thighs were of what? Brass. That represented what kingdom? Greece. Greece. You're right. Then we go, it's good to have you back, Lamar and Colleen. Thank you so much for attending church here as our longest um, uh, membership people in this place. Uh, We missed you when you were gone. His legs were of iron. What did that represent? 
Rome. His feet were part of iron and what? Clay. And what did that represent? The divisions of the Roman Empire, what you and I would know today as modern Europe. And it's interesting that Daniel in his, right now he's delivering the dream to the king. He's not interpreting, but when he gets to the interpretation, look over at verse 42. Daniel 2 verse 42. It says, and as the what? Daniel 2 42. And as the what? Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's just take a wild guess. If we were to count every toe in here, and we were to divide them by the number of people whose toes we counted, maybe Pastor Bradley would like to do that. No, I'm just kidding. What would be the average number that we would come up with? Ten. I mean, you might be like at 9.8, 9.7, but if you rounded it up, you'd still be there. Because sometimes people get their toes cut off. Mm. Boy, I just want to curl my toes underneath my metatarpals when I talk about that. And, you know, sometimes something heavy falls on them. Sometimes they just fall off themselves, I guess. So, in Daniel 2.42, we get this detail in the interpretation that the toes are significant. The Roman kingdom was divided into how many empires? Ten different divisions of the Roman Empire. Then, in verse 34. He says, you saw till that a stone was cut out without hands and it hit the image upon his feet that were of what? Iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Now go back to the 40s here. We are going to verse 42 again. Daniel 2, 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and broken. And where, you, verse 43, and where you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. It says, and in the days of these kings. What kings is that referring to? The rulers of divided Europe. In the days of those kings, by the way, you and I are living during the time of divided Europe. As a matter of fact, you and I are living in such bad times, you could say that we are in the toe jam of Daniel chapter 2. This, this world is, is going a direction that you and I would not take it if we had our desire, right? Right? I mean, we're praying for our country, we're praying for our nation, we're praying for our leadership, we're praying that things get better. Jesus predicted that things would get what before he came? They would get worse. That doesn't mean we stop being compassionate and praying for people, even though we know that the country's going to get worse. God saves people one person at a time. And so here, the Bible tells us, go back to Daniel, you're still in Daniel 2, go back to verse 34. There's a stone cut out without human hands, and it smites the image on its what? On its feet. What event is represented by that stone that hits the image on its feet? Thank you. That stone that is cut out without hands that crushes this image on its feet is describing the event that takes place at the end of the end of time. And that event is the second coming of Jesus, the same event where heaven is silent for half an hour. Now here's where the millennium comes in. We see the second coming of Jesus in that stone that smites the image on its what? On its feet. And then the next word in verse 35 is what? Then. In between, camera people, I'm going that way. In between the stone striking the image on its feet, the Bible says, then. Then were the what? 
Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away so that no place was found for them anymore. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and did what? Filled the whole earth. So this is what we have. We have an event over here called the second coming. Silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. And the Bible follows that up by saying, Then all the kingdoms of the earth, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, all of them are gathered together at the same time in the same place. And then what happens? They are blown away. Like the, the refuse of, oh, check this out. So on Melanie's farm, what we use for bedding is rice hulls. How many of you love to eat rice hulls? Yeah, neither do chickens, so that's why we use it. But you can pick up rice hulls. You can, you can take a bucket of rice hulls and you can pick it up. And you can hand it to Jordan the very first time this happened. I handed it to Jordan and he about threw it over his head because it's very light. The wind will blow it away. What happens to all of these kingdoms over here? They're blown away. And then what happens? God sets up his kingdom. So in between verse 34 and 35, you have the thousand-year millennial period, which we will discuss not today, but another day. So Daniel chapter 2 contains that thousand-year period, the second coming of Jesus, and then the end of that thousand-year period where all the nations of the earth are gathered together and become no longer existent. The Bible says that this takes place after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, and here we are at the beginning of the end of time, the next great event that will take place in the future of humanity is the second coming of Jesus, where all of heaven joins our Lord and Savior on those clouds that are made of angels for the purpose of taking us off of planet earth where we will spend a thousand years with Jesus. Do you want to know what you're going to be doing for that thousand years? Oh, some of us have been studying this for a long time. And when we find out what we're actually going to be doing, some of us are going to say, I don't want to do that. And then we're going to have this internal wrestling because if we don't want to do that, then we don't want to be there. And if we don't want to be there, oh mercy, no eternal life. So wait, maybe we do. Do you want to know what you're going to be doing? Just keep coming back. That's all you got to do. Just keep coming back. This is the point. In Daniel chapter 2, there were two reasons for that dream. To help Nebuchadnezzar know what would take place in the latter days. Look at that. Daniel chapter 2. Look at that. Verse 28. The first reason the dream was given to Nebuchadnezzar. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And he has made known, I'm in Daniel 2, 3, 28. And he makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall happen in the latter days or what will take place at the what? End of time. Nebuchadnezzar must have been thinking, what's going to take place at the end of time? And so God gives him this dream. He sends the interpreter. He sends Daniel. And Daniel says, the reason God gave you this dream is so that you can know what's going to take place at the end of time. That's reason number one. Go to the next verse. Verse 29. As for you, O king, the thoughts came into your mind upon your bed. What should come to pass after this? So, two reasons for this dream. So Nebuchadnezzar could know what was going to take place where? At the end of time. And number two, so that Nebuchadnezzar could know what was going to take place between then and the end of time. But let me tell you something. Nebuchadnezzar didn't live beyond his own kingdom. So when Daniel interprets this dream, he interprets it not so much for Nebuchadnezzar, although it did work at the, on the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar's conversion story, it began to work on his heart that there is a God in heaven. 
Daniel interpreted this dream because God wanted you to know what was going to take place from the Neo-Babylonian Empire all the way up to the establishing of God's kingdom on earth. And so, hey, no-brainer type of question, right? Do you want to be in the kingdom of God? It's so easy. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, check this out. My brother was here last weekend. He's reading this devotional book written by Ted Hamilton, a physician in Nashville. And there was a section. It says there's 8 billion people on planet earth. Of those 8 billion, 2 billion identify as Christian. Of those 2 billion, 1 billion are Roman Catholic. Of the 1 billion remaining of the 2 billion that identify as Christian, half of those are Protestants. And they cover approximately 5,000 different belief systems. How, pray tell, are we going to share the gospel with the other six billion people if we can't agree on the color of carpet in church? I'll tell you, God can do it. He can do it in a heartbeat. So what's he waiting for? You know, God has power. And the Bible says that he could make the rocks cry out. I'd much rather have the rock cry through me than to have a rock speak to me. The choice is ours, right? God gives us an option. Do we want to be in the kingdom of God or not? Do we want to be able to live through this end of time period where there's no guarantee of when, when Jesus is coming and we know when the end of time began, but Lord, this world is crazy. Like how long is this going to take? God has given every one of us an out, and the out is to invite Jesus in. And when Jesus is in, he's going to push the devil out. Is it your desire to be in that kingdom over there? Oh, Jesus said, believe in me, and you will be there. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord. A road map. Uh, Signals on the side of a road, way marks where we could know the time of planet Earth. Lord, we do anticipate your coming. And we, like you, don't want six billion people that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ to be lost. We are asking that you will give us courage to take every opportunity of sharing Jesus with someone, living the Christian life, helping other people to see that even though the world is going the wrong direction, that there are people in it that are looking the right direction, that are looking to Jesus, whose kingdom they are part of. We love you and we thank you for the truth of Scripture. We ask that you will bless us this week as we read through Daniel 2 and 7 and 8 and 9. And let's just read the whole book, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome back, young man. Thank you. Scott makes these prophecies so visible, doesn't he? So real. It's such a pleasure. And you know, if you take your hymnal, everybody take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 596. That's the one we're going to sing to close. Look for the way marks. Let me just give you a little story. If you look up at the top, it says that F.E. Belden wrote this song. F.E. Belden was, a, was an early pioneer of the Seventh Adventist Church. He was born in 1858. He wrote this song in 1886 when he was 31 years old. And, and we, we're still singing that song because we're looking for the way marks to get over there. To That's where we want to be. We want to be. Beautiful. Here. Thank you let's for that all, story. Let's all stand and sing together hymn number 596. <clears throat> Got a vest on? 
Look for the way marks as they journey on. Look for the way marks passing one by one. Down through the ages, past the kingdom's floor. Where are we standing? Look the way We're going to keep singing this song week after week till we can do it. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks. Down through the ages, past the kingdom's fall. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks. The journey's almost over. First, the Assyrian kingdom ruled the world. Then, Medo-Persia's banners were unfurled. And after Greece had universal sway, Rome seized the scepter where we are today. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks, down through the ages, past the kingdom's four. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks. The journey's almost over. We're almost done, Lamar. <laughs> Down in the feet of iron and of clay, we can divide it soon to pass away. What will the next great glorious drama be? Christ and his coming and eternity. Hallelujah. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks. Down through the ages, past the kingdom's four. Look for the way marks, the great prophetic way marks. The journey's almost It's almost over. Father, thank you for giving us direction, for revealing to us through your word what would take place up to and then even after the end of time. May you be praised and glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please remember this afternoon, 2 p.m., we will be remembering our dear friend, Miss Jenny, and it should be a good time of life celebration.